Right, okay, listeners, so we're in for episode 41 of the Legacy Podcast. I'm joined today by a very special guest today. Goes by the name of Jace. If you don't know him already, here's a bit of context for us. So I've followed you for quite a while now, obviously. I've, I've followed like a couple of your preps and just overall the content that you produce. So other online coaches that are listening, do go check out his page. I'll leave it in the description because you are guaranteed to learn a lot. So I'm going to hand you over to Jace now. So if you could just give us a bit of an insight into you as a person, what you do, and just a general update of how, how things are for you at the moment. Yeah, so at the minute I'm just on my coach for contest clients and for general, you know, clients that just want fat loss or yeah. general clients that want to maintain or build any muscle mass, you know, so lifestyle clients and comp clients, majority comp clients, so we'll run off 2019, I had uh, put 61 people on stage, wow. uh, everyone bar one placed in the top three. You know, that year we had three British champions, so it was uh, looking to start the year again with 15 people in the first show, so when I go to a show, people are like, Fuck, he's got 15 clients in, in the show. Yeah. Uh, so we were looking to start there, but unfortunately with Corona and stuff, um, it all pretty much went its up. So uh, now, you know, I haven't really lost any clients, if any, after I've gained clients because, you know, everyone knows they need that sort of accountability. So any online coach is watching this, you know, if you do want to retain your client base, what I would say is just, you know, wake up every day and think, how can I add value to my clients? You know, even if that's just sending out a daily workout or, you know, just checking in or sending them a motivational podcast each day, something so small can go a long, can go a long way for some other people. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Just online coach, pretty much full time. Been doing it four or five years now. You know, you scroll through my Instagram. Like I say to a lot of online coaches, well, your Instagram's a catalog. You know, every other picture I've got a client, you know, you go on my page. You know, you don't have to DM me and say, are you an online coach? It's yeah, there for you yeah. to see. It's there for you to see the results. So all I say is your Instagram, the catalog, utilize that platform. It's the biggest advertisement platform in the world. And it's absolutely free. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. So obviously, um, a lot of your clients with you specializing in comp prep, with them having planned shows, how have you sort of handled the protocols? You know, have you transitioned them into off-season, sort of like body recon phases? How's that transition been for your team of clients? Well, pretty much if a client comes to me, I'll normally say, very exceptional genetic freaks. I'll take them on like 10 weeks out. But a majority of guys will start 16 weeks out. So we'll go into a contest prep. So for example, Corona took over three or four weeks out. We didn't do a contest prep and it was majority, you know, let's get health back in the right place. Because yeah, yeah. a lot of clients kept saying, I want to keep biting them. Say, why? Yeah. You know, you know, this sport is about longevity. Your bodybuilding is not healthy. I'm, I'm the first one to say it. Mm. So there's no point pushing for another four or five, six weeks. Yeah, yeah. Knowing that, you know, if you want to do another prep at the end of the year, only you prep for half a year. So a lot of guys, we just um, I like to keep cardio in the off season to prevent getting sloppy, and then I'll just slowly taper up cardio and then taper down food because I like to create that seesaw effect. Yeah. You know, because a lot of guys go in the off season, they're like, all right, I'm going to have an extra thousand calories, I'm going to cut cardio, and your body's pretty much, and you know, if they're cutting any uh, performance enhancing and cutting drugs, you know, you you pull three variables out, your body's only going to you know, this one very badly. So you want to take absolutely everything down, you know, that's including the cycle, uh, that's including your cardio, and you want to slowly taper up food. You don't want to eat too much too quickly. You're just going to jeopardize all the work that you've done. Yeah. You know, end of the day, it's not an eating contest. People love to say, you know, oh, I'm on 5,000 calories. No one really cares how much calories you're on. Yeah, yeah. I feel that's a massive trend when people rebound. You know, I'm rebounding on 5,000, 1,000, and I can't really don't care because it's about what you digest and what you utilise. And, you know, you can eat that, but if you look like a piece of shit, you're going to just have a hard prep. Definitely. So, a lot of guys, my advice is keep a bit of cardio in, slowly reverse out your diet phase. Yeah. I can imagine as well that sort of change to calories and, you know, bumping stuff up and playing around with variables. For those that are wanting to improve on weak points, it's giving them sort of like a second chance to really improve their chance of winning for when shows do go ahead and when they can re-approach those preps for next year as well, which ultimately can be a blessing in disguise as well. Yeah, you know, ultimately it is a blessing because uh, you like like myself, my show were cancelled two weeks out. Yeah. I, was in, I was in the environment to fly to New Zealand. You know, I got my physique to a point where I was happy, but now I'm like, you know what, it can be much better you know, I didn't push to the extreme, but I got to a point where I could see this is a weak point, this is a weak point. And, you know, I've kind of got a few more months, so hopefully when you look at them weak points and you work on them, the next package you put on stage you'll be very fucking proud of because, you know, you've sort of got that second chance to improve it before you showcase it. Definitely. So, like, a lot of the guys, I say, just use this as a draft. Yeah. It's a draft, and now you know what to improve. You know the process. Cause I work with a lot of first-timers. Um, that's a, a massive market for me, a lot of young lads. So I say, you know, 
you, you, what you like, I say to what, what, what I like to say is, um, it's not about the end product; it's about the process. One hundred percent. Yeah. You know, so when I break it down, it's not about the trophy; it's about what have you learned from this prep. You know, a lot of guys will learn. You know, I can diet. You know, I can train. You know, I can be resilient when I don't want to do cardio. You know, you learn your friendship circles on prep. You learn your social circles. You learn who supports you. But at the end of the day, I say to a lot of guys, you know, when you typically start a prep, you get in shape. People give a shit. Your Instagram goes sky high. So I tend to say to a lot of my guys, I'm like, it's not about the end product sometimes. It's about the process. And a lot of you guys haven't got to the end product, but you've started to, um, you start, you started, you started the process pretty much. So yeah, Yeah. even for myself, you know, when I was in Dubai and I prep, you know, Prep would call if I was like, nah, do you know what? The process was actually really good to this point. Yeah, yeah. Definitely as well, enjoying the process across any aspect of bodybuilding offers a lot of benefits because if you know if we've got people just constantly searching for that pro card or winning that region or show, all that's gonna happen is as soon as you get to that location, you're gonna have this feeling of not feeling accomplished or satisfied and you're just gonna live yeah. a life of chasing what could be sort of thing. Whereas if you find yourself in the process, there's a lot more take homes. 100% man. There's, a, there's a lot of take from it like you know, a lot of guys are tipping me to fucking hell you're going to turn pro in classic yeah. you know I was getting that left right and then and my coach Jamie was like bro it's not it's not when it's going to happen it will happen but it's not when you know and I didn't even have that you know every now and then it crossed my mind but I was like you know what I just want to enjoy the process because at the end of the day you know you're only setting yourself up for a downfall if you don't achieve and you know the negative effect of that after you know self doubt will creep in you know you'll be kicking yourself you know and especially if you voice on social media you know, if you don't achieve that goal, you feel like you've come up short and then, you know, that can lead into a lot of negative effects. So I say to a lot of my first timers, you know, and then like I, I, my coaching methods pretty much you like me or you don't. Um, you know, I'm a lot of first timers say, bro, I'm going to smash the show. I'm going to win my class. And I say, just focus about getting on stage. Yeah. Nothing else. Yeah. Don't think about winning. You know, it's nice. You know, I'm prepped to go second, but don't blow your trumpet. Just focus on getting on stage. Because a lot of guys drop out at four weeks out. So I say the main variable is focus on getting on stage and let the judges do the rest of the work. Yeah, one hundred percent. So it seems like by the t- by the sounds of it, you work a lot of mindset and almost in a t- in a sense like affirmations with your clients. Do you think that links highly to the success of your you know your coaching business? Because I don't see much coaches doing the stuff that you're doing. Um, I think it does because at the end of the day, like it may sound, uh, you know, I'm very much like. No excuses. There's a way. Find a way. Yeah. And, you know, it may be harsh, but I'm, you know, like, you know, if you've had a shit day, forget about it. Overcome it and adapt it. And a lot of guys will say to me, "Fucking hell, I'm coming to work with you because your work ethic or you know the way you approach your fights." Because end of the day, bodybuilding is a very lonely sport. Yeah. You know, your, your coach ain't there just to give you a diet. Yeah. Your coach is there ain't the whole journey, and that's what a lot of coaches forget. You know, you're not a nutritionist. You're a coach. Yeah. You know, and a coach comes under many aspects. You know. So, you know, in my, in my head, I'm like, you know, if I can pick this guy up today, you know, and make him feel good, I might as well do that. You know, I think my, like I say to myself, mindset is key. 100%. Mindset is key to adherence. Mindset is, you know, when you have them down and dark day, it's the mindset that's going to separate you and keep you going. You know, because I'm not being horrible. Bodybuilding is not for mentally weak people. No, no, no. Especially as well with what I've learned from myself and, you know, I've not even been in the spot nowhere near as long as you. It's more so a way of life. It's a heavy, much like a lifestyle choice. Yeah. It often, often or not, bodybuilding is a centre of influence and it influences your choice, therefore, after that. So, yeah. it's important 100%. to understand that. You know, for like, even now, like, I put the story in lockdown, I'm like, you know, it's up to you how you lead this lockdown, you yeah. know. And that resonates with a lot of people. I get a few messages like, do you know what? I needed to hear that today. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because it takes something so small to have a big impact on people around you. And I just feel like a lot more people kind of shed a positive light than rather looking at the negatives. It's easier to look at the negatives in a situation like this. Like I said, if you're resilient in a situation like corona, you will, you know, if you're a resilient person, you'll be able to overcome and adapt. Yeah. If you're an excuse maker, you're just going to make more excuses. That's what you know, yeah. there's two types of people. So yeah, yeah. in my, I'm like, you know what? If anyone in my team's sticking up to make excuse, I'm going to try transition them to try and be resilient. Yeah. You know, can't help everybody, but you know, sometimes I'll be like, someone messaged me, shit, I felt shit. Two days later, they offered to speak to me, I feel good. So uh, yeah, because I think mindset's everything. Yeah, big shift what I've seen in terms of myself as a person, and then what I've been able to project onto the clients is. Focusing on what you can't control versus what you can't control. Often or not, when you said about the excuses, it's a similar effect. You know, if you focus on what you can't control, 
you're just going to live a life of not being in control and you're going to be in a losing position if you focus well, you, what's you, in your control that's when stuff can get interested you can only control the controllables what's in your court like yeah. you know i see a lot of guys slamming boris johnson or slamming the gyms are closed say to my clients you have not personally been victimized they have not picked you out everyone's in the same boat yeah, of course. I mean, people are acting like they've been picked out singular. Yeah, We're yeah. all in it together, you know, so it is what it is. And, yeah, pretty much just control what you can control. Like, you know, a lot of my guys are saying, you know, I haven't got the gym facilities. I said, great, but you have got the cardio facilities. You can control how many steps you can do. You can control if you get six or eight hours sleep. You can control what you put in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh. there's, there's three variables there that outweigh one variable. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you can control them three. You can control if you save twenty pound a week or spend twenty pound a week on dominoes and buy a barbell in six weeks. That's your choice. Yeah. I've well, said to a lot of my guys, it's up to you what's important, you know. It's been in lockdown six weeks. I, I know guys that are slamming two for Tuesdays every week. If it meant that much, they wouldn't be doing that and they'd be buying a barbell if their goals meant as much to them as they wanted to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well people need to stop pointing the finger and maybe step back and be like what can I do? Yeah. Well, I've seen in this sport a lot. A lot of people don't take ownership. One hundred percent. The thing about they don't take ownership. Like everyone, even myself, I could have done things a bit better. You know, so it's just one of them things. Is you know, there's three or four variables you can control against the one you can't control. Exactly, one hundred percent. And then obviously we can start looking into you know making the right choices opposed to yeah, slightly 100%. less right choices. If you think of the money people have saved during this lockdown, you know, for example, oh, reduced takeaways, less nights out, that could have oh. up to easy, you know, four or five hundred pound a month, which there you go is a bench right there. Or a couple how many of pounds has your mate said to you twice a week? Let's go get a Nando's. You spent right. forty pound a week on something you don't need to eat. Yeah, straight away. You know, you know everyone. There's no doubt that the people are driving less. You know, people are not being as social. So everyone saved money, which they could put that aside and invest in something if their goals mean as much. If it doesn't, so be it. But, you know, if you're preaching your goals mean so much and you're looking to blame someone else, you know, you pretty much say, you know what, have I done everything I can to make sure that I've prioritised on my behalf? Yeah, 100%. And I think that's just going to show, you know, when people come out of this lockdown, because I think going into lockdown was a big transition, but going out of lockdown and readjusting to normal life, I think that would perhaps be an even bigger transition. Yeah. And, you know, you're openly in control and you leave lockdown. You know, I've seen some guys progress even more so in lockdown yeah. than they have outside because there's no distract, there's no social distraction. Yeah. So I, had a, I had a lady, she said, first time I stuck to my diet. Because, you know, Thursday night after work, I'm not going for drinks. Yeah. yeah you know, so some people are actually leaving it better than what they came in. And hopefully they carry them habits back out and uh, readjusting into real life. Definitely. You know, so a lot of guys, like, I say it's, uh, if, you know, if you've only got a barbell, I think it's great because, you know, we, we all started training probably in our house with just a barbell or a set of dumbbells. So yeah. we kind of reverse time. And, I, you know, we haven't got 200 kilo on load, so we can slow down movements, make them more acute, you know, and make sure we hit the target muscle, make sure the tempo is fine and refine in form. So now is the time to redo the basics. Yeah. You know, nail them with your 100 kilo load. And when you get in the gym, you've earned the right to add load to them. So there's many positives to take. And I think a lot of people see that physique flourish. Uh, I feel like a lot of people were tied into certain splits in the industry and, you know, now they, they haven't got an opportunity to log every lift or do this. So it's like, you know what, the basics actually do work. Yeah. So anything they do in the gym now, their body's going to cause crazy adaptation. So pretty much as everyone's got a restart. Yeah, we can definitely really milk this sort of like reprogramming phase of training, especially in terms of execution. I've been asking for a lot more feedback. You know, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of clients that have good home gyms. So all it's been is just constant feedback on video execution. And what it means now is as we can nail the execution, which is the stage one of developing any training program, we can just absolutely rinse the sessions when we go back. As well, you 100%, you know, I'm getting that. I'm getting guys to send their top lifting every week. Yeah, yeah. One of their sessions, you know, I'm seeing a lot of squats that they call squats. And I'm like, you know what, let's reduce the load, yeah. take the tempo down and, and work on ankle flexibility, things you won't work on in the gym. You, you, you just can't be bothered. Yeah. You know, now there's enough time to do that. And I've got a lot of guys doing more mobility work or, you know, making sure they're recovering well. Because these are things we can do with a lot of free time. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's just going to reprogram everyone's training 
And, you know, like I just say to my clients, master the barbell. Don't buy these fancy things. Just get the barbell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, obviously, shifting straight directly into training, how have you as an individual found training? Because, obviously, you know, we was all in gyms before. And so, have you sort of invested in kit? How have you handled the um, transition? I'm very lucky. How can I word this? I've made the correct life decision where I'm pretty fortunate to still have keys to a gym. Oh, okay. So, but I, I've still got in my house, I did still bring home a barbell. Uh, I can see it over there, uh, 100 kilo worth of plates. Because yeah. ultimately, I'm like, you know, a lot of people, like, I see another bodybuilder on Instagram put up his training, like, James Hollings there put up his training, like, a gym, and people like, but you're training in the gym. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, the correct life decisions that yeah. he's got access and keys to a gym. You know, he's invested in a gym, it's his equipment, you know, so I'm very fortunate I've made them correct life decisions where I put myself in a position. To have access to a gym uh, by all means you know i do still do some more workouts you know because i'm like some days i'm like you know what everyone's in the same boat so pretty much when i do them i started off just working by the german volume training when i didn't have enough load because like, i don't have enough load yeah. and i brought home load and uh, the best split now with a barbell will probably be upper lower that's what i've been on to uh, legs push pull would be great if you've got some sort of you know, a corner roll or something, but there's just not enough movement you can do. Um, so I think upper lower, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll still yield a lot of growth. And, you know, if you do upper lower with a barbell complex and, you know, your protein's high enough, you've got no excuse really to regress. Yeah, definitely as well, especially if we look into the actual, you know, the science and methodologies behind the drivers of hypertrophy. For example, in the gyms, we would often work in that five to nine, we'd, be, we'd have that load to create that five to nine or, you know, work with hundreds yeah. of kilos worth of weight. All that's changed now is we've just got to readjust our programs. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, where people got set in one split, you know, exactly. the progressive overload method. You know, so now it's quite great that everyone, you know, who's log booking and being so anal, it's like, doesn't matter now. Like, this is the jungle. you got to work with what you got and make Definitely. it work. Yeah. So essentially, you know, because you're performing over them rep ranges, hopefully your cardiovascular performance when you go back in the gym is better than when you were just married to five to nine. And hopefully it transitions into lift slider pretty quickly if you microload them, you know, because the first thing I realized when I was uh, doing progressive overload five to nine, and then I went out to oxygen in Abu Dhabi for three months, the first day I was absolutely blowing because yeah. they, they just trained volume and I just couldn't keep up. My body was wrecked for like three days and it wasn't the load. It was like my body couldn't keep up with the capacity of how fast paced it was or the volume. So hopefully now people get the best of both of us because when you look at lockdown, you know, we pretty much ran a whole new training plan for 12, 12 weeks. Yeah. And when lockdown was done, 12 to 16 weeks, you can max out a training plan. So everyone go back to progressive overload now. You're only going to see benefit. Yeah, 100%. And as well, it just means now that we can just reprogram and create that new stimulus to grow from. And then oh, it just means, again, we can readapt. Because it's always about creating ad an adaptive response for our training. So as long as we're consistently changing and adapting, we're always in a position to make progress. 100%, like, I know a lot of guys that ain't done barbell squats for two, three years, and now yeah. they've got to do barbell squats. They're only going to progress. Yeah, 100%. When you get back on that pendulum, you know, you're, gonna, you're only going to progress. Yeah, yeah. Because we're still able to follow a lot of, you know, a barbell squat is still a squat movement pattern, a pendulum squat is still a squat movement pattern. So it's just about finding similar movements and mimicking that sort of, you know, reality program that we usually yeah, would follow. Yeah, mimicking it, mimicking it with ultimate form, which can't even be jeopardized. Like, no, no one, not one person should be able to look at your video and be like, that's wrong. Yeah, 100%. It, that's the benefit we got now. And, you know, another thing I like to see is people are becoming innovative. You know, yeah. people are quick, they're thinking outside the box. And, you know, what's this to me? Like, I know I'm a coach, but I shouldn't say this, but, you know, some of my clients are thinking for themselves. Yeah. It's just quite, it's quite cool to see people. You know, like I say to my clients, I want to coach you, but I don't want to babysit you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I see a guy today with his knees on the bench, his heels hooked under, like, the bar on the power rack. He had a band over here, and he was doing a Nordic hamstring cut. And I was like, well, I haven't even I thought see, of that. Yeah, I've seen that myself, yeah. It was yeah, like the, yeah. the hack squats as well with the foam roller. So it's a yeah. moment now we're now not loading the lower back, but we're still able to create that knee flexion to target the quads. In, in the each. quads and around the teardrop. Like, yeah. it's crazy. Like, it's nice to see people are getting creative with their training and well, a lot of people, I still believe, will carry similar movements across to the gym. I do believe we will see the foam roller, the foam roller replicated in the gym just with heavier dumbbells in each hand because you know, I personally tried it and it's a great movement. Definitely. It's, it's good as well because, like I say, we don't have to load that lower back. Um, and it just means another variable for people that do struggle with perhaps a barbell squat in terms of mobility. We can just transfer and create that new program in terms of you know using the foam roller hack squat. 
Yeah, 100%. So, um, and as well, what I found as well with a lot of like lifestyle clients, I don't coach, the, you know, the more prep clients, but going into the general lifestyle ones, I found as well, uh, they've struggled with motivation. So going into that routine touch, I found routine to be the biggest driver and just re re-adapting our lifestyle. Yeah, no, 100%, like, routine is key, especially lifestyle clients, because they've got, like I said, like, the lady who I have is, like, after work, I go and have a gym. Yeah. Like, they're forced, they can't do that anymore. So they're like, you know, I've got an hour spare in the evening, I'll actually do a workout. Mm. So it's quite nice. So just hoping that clients, if they carry that along, you're just going to see more client progress. And I don't know, I'm sure you're like me, if I see client progress, I get so excited. Yeah, 100%. Even just, just any sort of thoughts, like, form of feedback, um, you know, something as simple, I found as well, just stripping it back to basics. So if people are struggling on a routine, something as simple as splitting the day into three halves. So you've got your morning, afternoon and evening. I always yeah. get clients to plan the day out. So I'll always plan my day out. And just by planning your day out and writing down a little bit of tasks, using the steps to improve on CV fitness, before you know it, we can create a new adaptive, you know, uh, routine to follow from. Well, I'm like, I say to my clients, get up and make a power list. Yeah. What are you going to do today? What are three to four or five things you're going to do today that you wouldn't normally prioritize on a day to day basis? And that can be so lot of those. You know what? Like last night, I got on Ben Picolti's podcast and listened to it before bed. Normally, I don't have time to do that. Yeah, so, I'm yeah. like, well, what can I do every other night or every night, you know, that I'm not doing that I can gain value from? Yeah. And it, it's been it's been good for me to really work on like the habits that I need to set for, you know, my followers, my, my clients as well. For yeah, example, yeah. To you listening to the podcast. I'm working, you know, I'm investing in multiple member sites. I'm doing like up to three to five lessons a day, focusing yeah, on the craft. Yeah, well, there's doing. many sites out there that I recommend. Like, obviously, Jordan Peters' site, Colin Muscle Mentors have got a great site as well, That's, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's probably one of the most informative on, online at the minute. Mm. You know, so there's many, um, there's podcasts that you can pick up free information, Ben Bukowski, you know, there's so many things out there at the minute. Like, if you search, you can find a lot. And, you know, if you want to go even deeper you know you can search research papers if you know if you want to start backing up evidence if you know some of the facts you're giving across so a lot of time to learn you know i'd rather like don't get me wrong we all love sitting and watching netflix but you know there's a, there's a time to prioritize you can factor in, in your power it's one hour of learning a day yeah, exactly just you as know? well you know just just building on habits like if you're structuring your day you can still structure in downtime which is still very much important you know i have my downtime but I will still plan out my day to which I'll dedicate a lot to learning, to investing, and always trying out new skills. And that will show coming out of lockdown to the other people. Oh, it will show, it will show massively. Like, mm -hmm. it will show massively. And a lot of coaches will lose clients because they're just like, you know, you're not adding value to our service. Now is the time to add value. Yeah. You know, so it's good in that sense. Yeah, yeah. So obviously going into coaching, sort of like you've been in the industry quite a while now, a bit longer than me. What do you think has changed from the start from when you was getting into it versus to this current stage now? Oh, what I'd say is change. It's more competitive. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Like, when I first came to the industry, there was like, every year there was like two or three good coaches. Yeah, yeah. It's just a more competitive market because uh, it's just like competing. It's a, like, it's not a trend, but people think, you know, people say to me, I want to be an online coach. I do yeah. say it's a 24 hour office job. Definitely, yeah. You know, I probably look at my phone now, I probably got a WhatsApp update. It's not, it's not, oh, sit there, write a few times, sit down for 12 hours of the day. I've had phone calls with people in America today. I've had phone calls with clients in the UK today. It's a 24 hour office job. So a lot of people see it and they think, oh, you know, I'll get some people in shape, earn some cash, you know, work when I want. No, you work on your client's demands. Yeah. If you sell a client, your plan's going to be out Wednesday. You've got to work Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't think people really um, do enough research before they say, I want to be an online coach or, you know, I want to be a PT. So I just think it's more of a, um, not a trend, because I don't want to put that word on it, but it's more, you know, more people think it's easily accessible because of Instagram and, you know, they're seeing more yeah, online coaches. Time. So, but yeah, the biggest thing that I've changed is a more competitive market. Yeah. It's a more online market, you know, in 2015, 2016, you know, I know people working with coaches and have to see them face to face and they get their bio on a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, now I, I work with coaches and I'm getting crazy documents, you know, yeah. open up their videos with every movement. You know, so um, just the uh, media platform, I'd say, has changed massively. Yeah. The media, like four years ago, there was no such thing as subscription site. Exactly, yeah, yeah. There was none. And, you know, so I'd say media driving and just a more competitive industry, which I think then links into, you know, people want to put themselves across in a better light so they improve their media. Mm. Yeah. I found, 
Yeah, I found as well, you know, a lot of us coaches do work for ourselves, we're established within our own brands. And the idea with business is you want to build an empire, don't you? An empire is built of strong foundations. If you start off and get into the coaching world chasing it for money, you've automatically failed on foundational stages. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna, gonna fizzle out. You're gonna fall backwards. Like I remember I wanted to coach in twenty sixteen, I was under a coach and mentor pretty much. I went to every single show in the UK BFF calendar yeah. every weekend. I was just like, I want to see how you peak guys, you know, yeah, yeah. I want to see how you handle clients on show days, um, you know, and I went every weekend unpaid, yeah. you know, crazy Newcastle and back in the day, stayed in hotels, and also people say, fuck, you do so well, because like, show day I'm so relaxed, yeah, yeah. Everyone's like, what, I'm like, you know, because I've done this walk many a time, yeah, yeah. You know, so when I started, you know, not a lot of people are willing to self-invest, yeah. or even free, like, in 2016, I was like, you know what, I said to the guy, I said, no, I'll come to you every week. I'll meet you in the morning and come to the shows and back for you. And they were like, some people were like, what? what are you doing? You ain't got no clients. I said, but I want to learn. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, know, like, I know show day protocol to the team pretty much. Yeah, no, that's great. That. For me, it all started just, you know, I would, I would learn something new in the gym and it was that buzz of teaching it to my friends, teaching it to yeah, potential 100%. clients. That buzz of them learning that new skill set that you know essentially was taught by me is something that's still very prevalent now, and that's yeah. that passion is just you know one of the best coaches uh, qualities of a coach. Sorry. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So, yeah. so um, so obviously the qualities of coach. What do you think, mate? The qualities of a good coach. Uh, you know what? Like I say, the qualities. I go through both the qualities of a good coach and the qualities of a good client. I might actually do an IDT video. But yeah. a quality of a good coach is someone you can communicate with, you know. Um, and my clients come to me and like, they message me like, sorry, I don't want to pester you. My first reply is, first of all, don't ever say sorry. Yeah. Secondly, I say, you know, pay for a service, fucking utilise it. Yeah, yeah. You want to send me a hundred questions, send me a hundred questions. I might not respond to you in one minute, but I will respond to you. So, I think being able to communicate with your coach and not have that fear of I'm asking a stupid question, if that makes yeah, sense. No, I understand that a lot. So comfortability with your coach, should I say. Comfortability with your coach. Uh, a little bit of a rapport. So you feel like you can to with your coach in any need. And I think a diverse coach, yeah. um, not my way or the highway, yeah, yeah. accommodating to needs. Yeah. You know, cause like I say to my clients or any new clients, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. You know, don't just have to be my way, you know. And I know there's a lot of folks it's my way or the highway or, yeah. you know, I've proved this or I've proved that, so it's got to work. No, so being diverse as a coach, um, you know, be, having your clients be able to communicate you and having that sort of rapport with your clients and just being honest, uh, I think, is a massive fact. Like, the amount of times I've heard, this person, I'm going to turn you pro or, you know, yeah. you're going to win the British. I'm like, you can't guarantee that. So I'd rather not put close hope in anyone's head. Uh, I'll never promise a client, you know, if they message me in DM and say, you know, they send me a picture, can I get in shape like this guy? I'll never say, yeah, just to get the sign up. You know what I mean? Just yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to sign up or people making, coaches making false promises. I'll, I'll help you lose 15 kilos in 12 weeks. But then the day, if that don't happen, it's on your head. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of want to be true to yourself and true to yourself. So I'm not, yeah, I would say don't make false promises. Don't make any promises. Mm. You know, because it's a two-way street. You could do everything on your behalf, but the client don't. Then you know, oh, we don't promise girls. So, being a very honest in your approach to clients. You know, other clients message me, I want to do a show, and I say you probably need two years off. Yeah, yeah. You know, get in, and I don't just want to say yeah, compete because I want your your money for the month. You know, I'd rather be honest. Uh, like I had a guy PM me, um, mate of mine, not even my client. He uh, he did a show right, he placed like third. Um, his weight limit was, he could be like 102 kilos. He came in at like 100 kilos and he said to me, I want to move up a weight class. Yeah. Said, You're not lean enough. Yeah. I said, you probably want to lose five kilos, not try to put on five kilos. You know, and yeah, you know, at first he was a bit like, you're a bit rude. Yeah. The but then when the dust settled, he was like, you know, I actually appreciate that because not a lot of people would tell me that, you know, when people don't place in their show and they say, Jason, like, why do you don't think I place? And I turn around and say, you probably need to be five or 10 pounds leaner. You know, it's not the response they want. But it's but the response they need. It's the response they need. When the dust settles and the adrenaline is low, majority of the time I get a message, John, I say, John, I do appreciate that. Yeah. You know, because uh, there's a lot of guys in this industry, you know, I'll put up a photo three week out and people are like, you're on the money. I'm like, I'm absolutely not. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, even now, like, 
I put my photos on Instagram, but then I'll send them to two or three guys. I know are going to be brutally honest with me. Mm. You know, like I've got a, I've got two days out before the coach I work with say you're not ready. I'm like, mate, I'm on stage in four hours. You're <laughs> not ready. Yeah. You know, there's always more you can do. So I think it's being honest in your approach. Yeah, yeah. And not just uh, making both accusations to claim the business. But I see that one a lot. Yeah, I think as well when it comes to shows as well, it's not uh, well. Obviously, it is correlative to the size, but as well, it's a big judge is always going to be conditioning. So if you need yeah, five pounds, you need no, to train to win. Condition's king, bro. Condition is king. Like, I've been to many shows now. Like, in the amateurs, yeah. the most conditioning guy pretty much win. Yeah, yeah. But people say, like, you know, your guys are placing the shows by all the standards. It's like, you know, I've gone to so many shows. I've seen the top 3,000 times. You know, I can see, you know, I've seen the shows with my mates. I'm like, that's probably the top three in that class. The majority of the time, I'm right. Yeah. Oh, so, um, mostly in the amateurs, I'll say the most conditioned guy weren't in there carrying enough muscle wins. In the pro league, it's about being conditioned and full. Yeah. Being conditioned with muscle. Well, that's the difference there, uh, which I see massively. You know, obviously being a pro, you need to carry more muscle. So it does still replicate. It's about being conditioned, but being conditioned and full. You know, there's no point being conditioned quite as a pancake. So, yeah, that's my advice to my amateurs. I say, you know, let's try to come to the field as we can. Not, as long as it don't jeopardise health. And then with uh, the pro leagues, I like to think of being conditioned and for that yeah. balance, which is hard to nail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as well, that honesty will always nail that strong work ethic from the start. You know, if you're oh, telling 100%. your clients they need five pounds, they will get that five pounds. And then oh, I get clients three week out say, "Bro, I'm ready. I'm on the money." I'm like, "There's still work to do." Because if I say you're ready, it's gonna go two ways. I've been there in my early years myself. I either go crazy on my cheating on the weekend because I think I'm ahead. Yeah. Or I back off my cardio and take it down a bit. You know, this because in your edge, you're like, you know, what? I'm ready. You know, I can take my foot figure. No, so I like just be like, no, bro, there's still a bit more work to do. Yeah, yeah. So how, always, yeah. So, um, how do you handle that mindset? You know, obviously with a bodybuilder, you're either always never big enough or never lean enough. How do you sort of gauge when it's time to step on stage? Because I'm sure even when you step on stage, you feel in the back of your head, there's still a little bit more you could have done, perhaps. So it's one of the things, if they're first time up, ultimately you can step on stage pretty much if you carry a bit of muscle. Because, like, you're in 11, a level playing field, you know, against a lot of first timers. Yeah. You know, and as a coach, your coach should be able to look at you and say, you know, what you're ready or to compete with or not. Because it's not a, like, definitive boundary to say, you know what, you're 80 kilos, you can compete. No, you can be 80 kilos and carry no muscle and six foot tall. Yeah, yeah. You know, so as a coach, it's, it's down only to your coach to make that decision. Yeah. You know, other guys come to me this week and say, I want to do the amateur Olympia. They've competed once in their life, and I've turned around and said, I don't think it's the right idea. Yeah, yeah. Then the day, I'm very honest, I say it's 180 pounds of register, and you're probably going to get blown away. But alternatively, there's a, there's, a, there's a regional show two weeks before. But I think it's all down to your coach uh, to make that decision. Ultimately, whenever I sign up with a coach, I pick my shows. I pitch my shows, sorry. And then I say, You make the decision, and I work. That's, that's typically what I say. I say I will pitch what I would like to do, but I've employed you, you make the decision for me, and I'll work from there. Yeah. I think most clients should do that. Pitch a set of shows, and then knock heads together, and then ultimately, you know, you're both responsible. Yeah, yeah. So obviously delving into your, you know, bodybuilding career, in terms of prep hurdles and what you've learned throughout your bodybuilding career, what hurdles have you faced, and how did you overcome them? Um, so the biggest uh, hurdle in competing which I would say is your environment, yeah. you know, your social circle in your environment, you know. This year I had the easiest prep I've ever had. Yeah. I know I did it out in Dubai, so it's a bit easy. You just wake up there, it's crazy, yeah. so you just want to work. Uh, but no, my social, social circle is key, you know, and it's not just like your mates hanging around with, I'm talking about your whole support system. Yeah. Well, end of the day, it's like, if you've got a partner who's making your meals, that's one stress off your head. Yeah, yeah. When I was in the bar, I had every single meal prep for me. I never thought about prepping a meal when I was up there. You know, I never got in from cardio and said, oh, I've got to prep a meal tonight. And that just correlated if someone's got a good partner behind them uh, who's making their meal. That's one less stress they've got to think about. That's one less thinking they've got to do every night. And your environment, you know, like I say, it's very rare to find a training partner who cares about you as much as you care about yourself. Yeah, yeah. My training partner, uh, Jamie Durego, I'm sure you know him. Yeah, of course, yeah. I remember... We were doing cardio one morning, so we start with like 45 minutes on the stairs. And the routine was get up, do cardio, 45 stairs, do adductors every day in the morning and then cast. And I think I did adductors 
I did the stairs, I did the doctors, and I went to the car. He come out, he come out, and bear in mind, he's on prep for, he said, he come out and said, why are you being a lazy cunt? Yeah. I was like, what? And he said, bro, why are you being a lazy cunt? You know, and I was like, this guy's on prep four weeks out and he cares about, you know, my progress as much as his own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's very rare to find that, like, it's very rare to find a training partner, like, well, I trained with Darren Farrell in Dubai and, you know, he was like, I was doing my set and he was like, you flagging? I was like, yeah, he said five more reps. He yeah. Said, I wanted to you win your show. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, you know, it's two types of training partners, you know, ones that are out there to benefit themselves or ones that want to benefit themselves but won't use progress as bad as they want to progress themselves. So any prep, I say to my clients, you know, you need to make sure you're in mental head, a great mental head space. You know, your surround, surround and support systems are amazing. You know, if you're going through so much uncertainty in life, like if you're on the rocks with your missus, if you don't know if you've got a stable job, if you're like, not even on a contract with your work, um, or, you know, you, you've got free for all of preps are probably not the best, you know, because you need every variable down to a T. Yeah. Or you think about prep, like, I've had preps where, you know, I've had uncertainty in my life and, you know, those preps, I've got through them, but having preps where everything is down to a T. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's massively different if that makes sense yeah definitely like, even now someone was like you're going to do the amateur row in 20 weeks and I said I would love to but I can't prep unless I've got 100 concerns if I know there's not going to be a second peak of corona if I know you know the shows are going to go on so I need everything to a team yeah yeah definitely for me as well a big driver has just been trained just like you said training with the right people when I sort of personal driver for me is training with people that are better than me. So say for oh, example, man. me as a coach, like I, I although we don't know each other personally, yeah. you are someone I hold in extremely high regards. And as a result, when I sort of surround myself with your content, AJ's content, see it, TM Cycles oh, content, that enables me to do more because I'm comparing myself to you know to people that have been in the game a lot longer. Yeah, AJ's so, lovely as well. Like, for like it's even for example, I'm good mates with Kuba. I'll see Kuba put on an IGTV, yeah. I'll be laying in bed. I'm like. You know, I need to stop being lazy. I need to put out eyes and see you, video. Yeah. You know I mean, you, you, you are what you surround yourself Definitely. with. You take, you take from that. You know, if I see like, I see I'm a good mate with Taylor. I laid in bed the other day, at five a.m. I was like, I'm gonna press news. I see him up on my fucking stairmaster one hour in the morning. Yeah. I said, like, you know what? I better get up and get on the stairs or get on do cardio. So it's like, you know, what you surround yourself with. You know, you are your circle. Definitely. You are who you know. You are who you put around the table. End of the day, if you're surrounding yourself with guys that are gonna bring you down. You know, eliminate that circle when, you know, people are scared to step away from that. You know, mm. don't be afraid because no one cares about your end goal as much as yourself. Like, yeah. I put up a post the other day, people are too busy seeking external validation from people who don't care. Yeah. I've had guys, you know, oh, Jason, I'm going to start a prep and then I'm hearing them in the gym telling five Jesus, what do you think I should start a prep? And I go over and I say, yeah. they don't give Same. a shit. Yeah. They don't give a shit. If you prep or not, all you want to hear is three guys say, yeah, 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 prep. That shouldn't influence your decision. You should prep because you want to prep. Yeah. You know, I compete. I do whatever show I want to do. Not because, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry says do that show or it's going to, you know, my mate's doing that show. That's the worst reason. Yeah. Don't seek external validation. In the day, start your journey. If people actually care, they'll mm -hmm. be there for the whole process of it. Definitely. I see yeah. that a lot. People yeah. doing things because a lot of people so. Yeah, you are what you surround yourself with. You're in a motivated circle. You're going to keep, you're going to want to do more, want to put out more, want to project content, you know, for 100%. You know, when I see other guys doing stuff, I'm like, fuck, maybe I should try this. And it's the thing, it might not work out, but then you can look back and say, do you know what? I gave it, I gave it the best swing in the back and see if it works. Yeah. And then often when you find that you look like on those decisions, the wins that you took, more often than not, it all came from being comfortable with being uncomfortable, if that makes sense. Oh, so I'm all the good. things come from outside of your comfort zone. Bro, when I started coaching, I had many guys in like my old gym, like first mates and that, like, bro, what are you doing? Like, why do you want to coach people? Or it's never going to work. Yeah, or, yeah. And imagine if I listen, I, my attitude always been like, you know, I've always progressed when I learned not to give a shit. Yeah. You know, and that's not in a cocky, arrogant way. It's just like inputting myself Definitely. first way. Like, you know, if you wanted to start this podcast and your mates said, oh, bro, I don't think it's going to work. And you turned around and said, do you know what? Yeah, yeah, let's scrap it. But no, you probably had one or two guys that would never say it to you, it's not going to work. Yeah. You probably thought, no, nah, it's not a good idea. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you're definitely. like, no, I'm going to go through with it because you're mentally strong. Yeah. And now, you, you know, you've got great people, Josh Bridgman, you've got great people on the podcast. But, you know, when you started this, you probably didn't think you would get. I literally remember hitting my first 100 plays. Now we've just closed two and a half thousand. Exactly, yeah. and that's only, that's only going to grow, it's only going to get better. Yeah. Better. And it's only going to get better. So, 
hundred percent you would have had guys sniggering or behind the scenes like, Definitely so. Yeah. Or, you know, you start seeing your guys, your mates not sharing the shit. Yeah. You know, or not liking your stuff. And you know, it's, it's very, very common that people close to you hate first before strangers. Yeah. Yeah. But again, that's just, you know, not every, you know, we're in this to win. Not everybody's meant to like you, are they? So it's just, yeah. it is what it is. And you're just not going to care. Resilience, about it. man. It's resilience. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, so, hate. yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, obviously, goals within bodybuilding. What? How far do you plan to sort of take bodybuilding as an individual? Do you know what? I'll be very honest with my approach. Here. So I've competed like I think four years now, and I've, I've always been in the top three. I've never been outside the top three. And you know, first show, first show, I was a junior. I was like twenty-one. I stood next. I was like, I went to my coach. Said, I want to do the men's today. Yeah. He looked at me like you're crazy. I said, oh, we got nothing to do. I think the men stood next to Rob Taylor. First show. Yeah. Looking over like, what the fuck have I done? <laughs> came third in the first show, did second show, came first. Year after, came first, came second. So I've always been in the top three, and it's always been like, I've quite got good genetics on my side, I'll be very honest with you. I get lean very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I sort of like, my goal at first, I was like, you know what, I want to be a household bodybuilding name. Like, mm. just like, I'm a household name, you know, you get a few yeah. of them guys like, um, Max O'Connor or someone like that, you know, the household names are just really good bodybuilders. Like, at the minute, say someone like Josh Bridgman, he's not a pro, but everyone knows who he is. Of course, yeah. So, my goal was to be a household bodybuilder, then I was getting a bit old, I'm only 25, everyone's like, what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I was like, do you know what? Then I was like, you know what, I want to be a household bodybuilder and a good coach. Yeah. You know, because when I was looking at the coaching, I was like, there's not a lot of coaches that actually compete. So I was like, do you know what, I can actually tap into a market there of I, you know, sometimes I get clients because of the way I look or the, my work ethic or my training yeah, ethos. Yeah. So then I was like, all right, let's try and make that balance of being a good coach and a good bodybuilder. Yeah. And then uh, we kept training and whatnot, investing in a few coaches. Then my physique kept developing. Yeah. And I went to Jamie DeRay, who always been mates for years. Right? He looked at me last year, just with a mate, and he was like, after our show last year, I won a show last year. Saxon, he was like, bro, I think you can like turn pro. He was like, I'll be honest, not in the open because. Personally, I don't want to be a 300 pound mass monster freak. That's not, it doesn't appeal to me. I'll be very honest. But I yeah. respect you guys. It's not maintainable for me. It's not marketable for the road and trying to go down. But I don't want to turn up the show to see clients and I'm not sweat running down my back. Yeah. So uh, you can see by my shape, everyone was like, why don't you try classic? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm very heavy for classic. I'm borderline the limit. So yeah. it was like the only shows I can do are the international pro shows. Uh, which run a pro am show because then they run the amateur at the pro way. So I can be heavy in that sense. But Jamie was just like, bro, I think you've got a great chance of turning pro in classic. And so it was pretty much, you know, that did turn the goal this year. Only, like, I'll be honest, it only turned the goal this year. It wasn't ever the goal. The goal was, you know, let's be a great amateur and coach. And then, you know, as we got, like, I was, you know, I was up and rolling pictures every week. Everyone was like, bro. But I get messages from people. Oh, that wasn't the no worries, no worries. Yeah, I get I get messages from people that are pro, and they'd message me and be like, "Bro, you look like a pro." Yeah. I was like, "What?" So that was pretty much a driver for me. So I personally believe I can turn pro in classic. Yeah, I can't turn pro in the open, and I'm not willing to. So my goal is, you know, if I turn pro in classic, I can be a few pounds heavier. So I'm comfortable with that weight limit and my small waist and body uh, pretty much accommodates that. So now the goal is not to compete till next year because of all the uncertainty. Do the show I was planning to do New Zealand again because I've got all my flights and stuff. And, you know, I'm a bit hungry now because, you know, when you're close to something, it's like, you can't do it. Or it gets taken away. When you're a kid and someone takes away a toy from you, yeah. how bad do you want that toy? So I'm eager to get on stage. But yeah, yeah. That's why now everyone's like, Jay, should still keep it tight. The Austin, because I'm like, you know, I've got a very fine margin of growing I'm not saying you know, I probably, the first three years I competed I didn't put on any 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 stage rate yeah yeah, yeah. I just got better mm. in the last 12 months I've got five kilos yeah so it's like it's like let's just uh, I'm, I, I know I probably won't put any on but I'll get better like my goal is never to be 10 pounds heavier it's to be I'm always like maybe I can be a kilo lighter and a bit tighter it's, my mindset is very different to a lot of people. A lot of people say, bro, next year I'm going to be five kilos heavier. My, I turn around and say, you know what, I'm going to be better. I don't yeah. care if I'm lighter or if I'm heavier. I just want to be that 1% better. Yeah. You know, even now, I didn't get to showcase the final package. I was like 111 kilos. I think I would have probably been like 10, 106 or so, dropping water or so. So 
I'm more excited to see that. So now the goal is to turn pro, but I don't really voice it. I don't like to voice it. Yeah. Like you said, like, you know, if I know it and my coach know it and a handful of people know it, that's all that needs to know. Um, so now it's just like the end of the year is to get as many people on stage as I can um, just to keep the rep going. Uh, 2021, we plan for a huge year. And then the goal is just to turn pro in due time. Like, I'm not going to chase it. I'm not going to do eight shows. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. sit down and we'll pick two shows. That's it. If it don't happen, we'll try again next year. Yeah, you yeah. know, I'm 25. Hands on my side. I'm not in a rush. It's not my main focus. My main focus is, you know, what puts bread and butter on my table. That's my business. Yeah, yeah. Well, anything is a bonus because end of the day, if I turn pro, people are going to want to work with me because I'm a pro. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I don't want to say I'm doing it for business, but it does um, help accommodate the business yeah. as well. So I do want to look at it like that, you know, because when I prep my, uh, my, um, the amount of inquiries I get when I prep is, is crazy because, you know, I'm up every day vlogging my cardio, vlogging my food, you know, vlogging my training, vlogging how I look, so people are in the nice state nosy. Yeah, yeah. I think as well, that's just, just the winning mindset. I remember something what JP said might have been to one of his clients, but it's, the, it's just the mindset of training to win. Training to win may be 10 kilos heavier or five pounds lighter. Whatever it is, you've got to do it to take to win. Yeah, I remember I did a show when I come third in the show and a lot of guys are like, oh, you should have won, blah, 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 blah. Like, it went crazy on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and I see Jordan in Manchester like a week later. Someone said to him, like, Jordan, you see Jace's results on week? And he turned around to me and said, you know, it's not about pleasing the judges. Like, have you honestly got better than last year? Yeah. I was like, hey, he was like, you, you won. You've essentially beat your physique. You won. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, you'll never see them judges again. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what I say to people. A lot of the time, like I say, that's why I say it's the process, not the product. If you're better than last year, the, the placing don't matter sometimes. One hundred percent. So that's the goal now is to just continue growing the business in that sense. Continue adding value. Uh, if it's competitors or not competitors, it's not really like I treat them all the same. Just helping people achieve their goals. And you know, if I turn pro, fingers crossed. I think it will happen in twenty twenty one. And if we attack this off season correctly, then so be it. If not, then so be it. Yeah. We just uh, keep having away at what's working. Yeah. No, 100%. Well, yeah. And obviously, you know, best of luck with that. But I think that's pretty much the full itinerary of what I wanted to cover with today's podcast. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure, man. I enjoyed it, man. It's yeah. nice to voice things across, you know, because you know, not a lot of people asking depth questions, you know, a lot of questions. Like, when you're competing, when you're going to turn pro, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's nice to yeah. depth chat yeah. and uh, get things across. No, it was good to sort of get an insight into how you take as a person and as a coach has been. This has been one of those podcasts where I will listen back to it. You know, I'll, I'll watch it whilst I'm doing tomorrow's steps tomorrow. There was stuff that yeah. I take on for, you know. Like even me, I'll listen back to it. Like every time I do them, I'll listen back and I'm like, you know, you even take some motivation from yourself sometimes. Yeah, definitely. So, but I mean, that wraps up today's episode. So is there anything else you want to add on to the end of that? No, I'm good. Uh, obviously, I said I'll uh, find some snippets, try to put it out, try to put yeah, out content because people do care. You know, they are interested in what you're putting out, what I'm putting out. So mm-hmm. just keep looking at it. Like I say to yourself, like seeing your platform grow. And, you know, like I said to you, when you was like, do you still want to do the part? I said, I'm actually eager to get on. So yeah. it's nice to actually knock heads and get it together. So, you know, end of the day, I want us to be able to sit here in six months, get on another podcast and see you with an extra 3,000 followers and like you know, see you yeah. and you turning around to me in six months. Yeah. And saying fuck me i've had so and so on the podcast you know yeah. so it's just all about elevation you know yeah. in the day like i say to a lot coming up to june now so pretty sure if you're like me i'm planning the last six months of the year so even for yourself write down three big fucking names you want to get on in the next six months yeah if you don't write you can't manifest it into reality so 100 uh, yeah. like you know yeah. want to touch base in like six months and both be like fuck i've done this and you've done this essentially everyone's uh in the winner's circle then yeah no again big thanks for coming on but that wraps up today's episode so i'll see you guys for the next episode soon